So then the next part of verse 6, the Lord God of the holy prophets. So then uh, the Lord God, that's his title. God is in charge of the holy prophets. The prophets God is the Lord God. Now notice that they, they're called holy prophets. Did you notice that? So that's going to be occasional in your Bible. You'll see holy prophets. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost who were writers. Holy brethren. A lot of times we would confuse this thing when we say holy and then a person is mentioned. We would sometimes be confused thinking that this would have to be like a sinless person, so to speak. But sometimes you got to understand this. There's a doctrine which is very important, which is called imputation. Imputation. Imputation is where God's counting the person as righteous. It's not that the person is technically sinless. He never sinned at all. It's in God's eyes, he says, I'll just count that person as sinless, as holy. Why? The reason why he'll say holy prophet, holy brethren, is because they're connected to a holy work. That's God's work. Isn't God's work holy? Yeah, so then obviously that's why he'll automatically dub the person as holy. Um, if you look at the book of Numbers, for example, it's amazing. The children of Israel are one of the most wicked people you'll ever find. And that's why even conspiracy theorists today think that Jews cannot still be God's people today. Why? Because that's just how wicked they are. That's plainly from the Bible and even today too. All right. Sometimes worse than a liberal, believe it or not, is actually an atheist or an agnostic Jew in New York City. Believe it or not. All right. So those people can be worse than all sorts of Muslim people combined and all liberals combined. But the idea is this. The idea is, is that despite of Israel being so wicked at the book of Numbers, the Bible says that God says he did not see sin in his people. Amazing. At the book of Numbers, he said that. Why? Imputation. You know what that means? That should make you shout and run the aisles. Gene Kim, I don't see sin in him. I imagine God saying that to the devil, right? Ma'am, less God. Make sure you want us. Makes you want to cry. Because why? You belong to Him. You're connected to His holy calling, His holy work. So He, con he counts you automatically as holy. And uh, one of the basic doctrinal teachings you should know is uh, the result of salvation. That's a, that's a great basic doctrinal teaching everyone should know. Because imputation is just one of them. Yeah. You got sanctification, redemption, remission, redemption. Man, it just goes up. Propitiation, justification. It's awesome, brethren. All right, uh, let's keep reading. So that's just one of the doctrines of imputation you want to understand. That's why he says uh, holy, apost holy prophets. Uh, the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants. So... Uh, the holy prophets God, he sent his angel, which we saw chapter 21 verse 9, right? And even chapter 1, I think there was an angel involved, where the angel showed John, showed, but it's servants. It's not just servant. So it's not, the angel's not just showing to John. God intended to show it to all of us. That's why John wrote the book of Revelation so that all of God's servants can see what he planned for us for eternity. Isn't that wonderful? That's just beautiful, brethren. The things, uh, the last part of verse 6, the things which must shortly be done. So in other words, everything that's happening in the book of Revelation, what you're hearing, it's shortly be done. It has to happen real soon. Well, God's a liar, I guess, because it's been past 2,000. Uh, it's been around 2,000 years already, if not past it. So then God's a liar. No, remember... The other doctrine that I taught you at Revelation chapter 1 is God's timing. 2 Peter 3, 8 through 9, uh, a thousand years can be like what? One day to God. So in God's mind, he's seeing only two days here. Right, right. And then that's why in your Old Testament and other verses in the Bible, there's a significance where God says at the third day, there's going to be some sort of life or resurrection or renewal. So see, to God, it's not long time. It's shortly that must come to pass. All right, let's keep reading. Verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. See, that's part of that doctrine. 
of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. We believe in it. This is so important. There's a lot of onliners who do not believe in this. And you got to believe in this. You better believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a doctrine that I taught to you before, a false doctrine, which is called post-tribulation rapture, or basically it's also called post-tribulationism, post-tribulation doctrine. Post-tribulation people, they either believe a rapture that's after the tribulation or they, uh, or they do not believe in a rapture at all. They believe that basically they're going to bring in the kingdom of God and then Jesus will be so pleased that he's going to come down and rule over the millennium. That's why you got a lot of churches saying we're building the kingdom of God here on earth. We need more of your offerings and they have to make more lavish buildings. You see that? That's all a post-tribulation doctrine, if not a amillennial doctrine. Premillennial, we're such, we're such pessimists saying that we, we, there's nothing good that we can do. We need Jesus Christ to come down to set up the kingdom for us. So that's a premillennialism, premillennialism. So in other words, before the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ, we need Jesus to come down and set, set up the kingdom. Right. Remember, post-millennium is that Jesus Christ... Uh, they believe that because they're building God's kingdom so well, then Jesus is going to eventually come down, eventually post-millennial. millennial they think we're in the millennium right now. <laughs> Very funny. And atheists still bring up the argument, if an all-good God exists, why is there suffering? So millennials they're out of their mind thinking that uh, we're living in the millennial kingdom right now. You think this is a millennial kingdom? Especially with COVID-19, the riots, and this idiocy that's rising. I don't think this is God's kingdom on earth yet. Ridiculous, man. This is the devil's kingdom. His minions are running the show. This is their kingdom. All right, but anyway, imminent return of Christ is any moment he'll be coming. Any moment. Why? Based on this verse, verse 7, verse 6, Behold, I come quickly. That debunks automatically post-tribulation rapture, post-millennialism, amillennialism, etc., etc. That kicks it out of the picture. We believe Jesus Christ can come down any moment. That's something amazing about that. Now, there is one thing I want to mention. This seems to conflict the idea of a time system where Jesus Christ is going to come down. That's what it seems like. However, I'm going to give you a few interesting arguments over here which some people don't know about. One, people don't know about where there are verses in the Bible where it says a person passing away shortly before God appoints a time. So a lot of time God would appoint times uh, and calendar and clocks, but a lot of times he can cut it short. What did Matthew 24 says? Matthew 24 says about the tribulation timeline, the Lord's going to cut it short for the elect's sake. So, why? Because God, this is God's clock. He can do whatever He wants. He wants to see how mankind moves and goes according to their free will. He's that type of God. So, a lot of times in your Bible, you got to realize this. There were so many times that the Antichrist could have came out and Jesus Christ could have came down. I mean, look, read the book of Acts. It's as if the disciples were expecting Jesus Christ to come during their timeline. See, it's an imminent return. They believed that he was going to come during their time, but actually they died off. And then Jesus still hasn't come down yet. Why is that? Because Jesus, we believe in this doctrine over here, and God, he can, uh, there were many chances the Lord could have came down, but because of mankind's rejection of Jesus Christ, uh, it, uh, it, postponed his, uh, it postponed his early coming. That's an interesting doctrine called the postponement theory. All right, which I'm not going to get into. But the postponement theory is basically is that if the Jews received their Messiah at the book of Acts, then when Stephen was about to be stoned to death, he said that Jesus was not sitting at the right hand of God. The Bible says he's sitting down until he comes down for us. But at Acts, he wasn't sitting down. He stood up. Why? Because it's as if he was about to start up the rapture over there. But then the Jews rejected, uh, they rejected Stephen's message. Now, if you read Acts 2, 4, and etc., so many times the disciples were telling Jews, get ready, the Messiah is going to be coming, the Messiah is going to be coming. But after Acts 7, did you notice the change there? 
What happened? They switched to Gentiles. And then Paul says God's about God's shaking the dust off of the Jews now. Jews, you're about to be done. And then later on, the Pauline epistles, got, uh, Paul says that they're done. They're put aside until later on. So um, when people were thinking during the days of World War II, Jesus was going to come, or like with COVID-19, or even years beforehand, you got to understand this is that uh, they're not entirely wrong. Because those could have been the perfect timetables Jesus could have come. You got to understand that. Well, why didn't he come yet? Because he's looking at the heart and condition of mankind first. So remember this, just because God has an appointed time, it doesn't mean that, he doesn't, uh, that that's going to prevent him from coming earlier. Because why? He can cut his time. Uh, there are verses in the Bible that I showed you that God can cut the time short, that he can come whenever he wants to. Why? Because time doesn't control God. God controls time. He can do whatever He wants with time. For all I know, uh, He could just be, uh, we could have been wrong about the calendars all this time, and He can jump forward time. I mean, He's all powerful. You never know what God might do, right? Okay, anyways, uh, let's look at uh, Revelation chapter 22. All right, so that was some deep doctrine, but we didn't turn all these verses to talk about that. That's going to be a totally separate subject teaching, but it's good food for thought yeah. to know, all right? All right, uh, verse 7, Jesus Christ is coming quickly. Blessed is he. So blessed is the person that what? Keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Ah, revelation. It is important where you keep, this, uh, keep the sayings, the words of God, when it relates to prophecy in the Bible. So here's the thing is that I mentioned to you before about people being infatuated with prophecy, but that doesn't mean you get rid of prophecy. God says, blessed are you when you're into prophecy. Why? Because we're talking about your future. Yeah. It's not just important to know your present condition, it's important to know your future as well. What God has planned out for you, what will happen to mankind. Blessed are you. So it is important to study Revelation. It is important to be familiar with end times. Uh, the basics of theology, one of the classes, is called eschatology. Eschatology is one of the branches in the theological Bible study, which is the doctrine of end times. So pastors should not belittle studying end times either. It is important. It is important. Be, in, as a matter of fact, because a lot of pastors lack in teaching end times, and then they focus about present conditions of being a better you and being happy. That's why a lot of people, they get bored or they're not growing. And here's another warning to the preachers. If you don't teach end time stuff, that's why they're going to turn to heretics who teach end time stuff. And these people are the majority. Majority of them are post-tribulation, if not post-millennial, in their teaching on end times. All right, let's uh, go back to Revelation chapter 22, verse 8. And I, John, John, so John is talking about himself, saw these things and heard them. He saw them, he heard them. And when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. So be, after John heard and seen everything in Revelation, he couldn't help but fall down and worship before the feet of the angel who showed him all those things. So we worship angels. No, look at verse 9. This is important. Then saith he unto me, the angel said to him, See thou do it not. The angel specifically told John, Don't worship me. All right? So then when you got these pretty little angels over the Catholic churches and people just bow down in front of the angel and pray before it, no, no, God says... Uh, the Bible says that's wrong. As a matter of fact, the verse, uh, the angel would tell you, make sure you don't do it. If you see some person doing that in front of an angel, why don't you go up to that person and tell that person, didn't you know the angel is telling you don't do it? Yeah. I'll show you a verse on that. Yeah. See thou do it not. Why? Because the middle of verse 9 says, for I am thy fellow servant. 
You got to realize this, the angel are fellow servants. As a matter of fact, they will even be your servant. Not just your fellow servant, they'll be your servant. Yeah. Why? Because they're going to be ministering to you, according to Hebrews chapter 1. Right. All right, let's keep reading. And of thy brethren, the prophets. So the angel is at the same level as uh, John's brothers and sisters in Christ and his brethren, the prophets. So John is in line with the fellow prophets, like Daniel, for example. How about that? And of them which keep the sayings of this book. So the angel is in line with the people who keep the prophetic statements in this book. That's us. That's us. The angel says, says this, just worship God. Last part of verse 9, worship God. So there's a group of Gnostics that Paul warned about, and we're going to be covering them in the Pauline epistles, who worship angels, the Bible says. These Gnostics were contemporary during the apostles' times. They were already corrupting the Bible during the time of the apostles, you got to understand. That's how Satan immediately moved in. You know how fast he moves in his poison? Right now. Within a church service, right now. Underneath your noses, where you least expect it.